Welcome to the Everything Building Envelope podcast. On this show, we discuss topics relating to the exterior building envelope, such as waterproofing, glazing, cladding, roofing, and more. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes and Stitcher. For previous episodes, show notes, and bonus video content, check out our website, everythingbuildingenvelope.com. Now, here's your host for the Everything Building Envelope podcast, Paul Beers. Welcome back, everyone, to the Building Envelope podcast. We're bringing back Tom Madigan today. He was with us in the last episode. It was really interesting, and we had a lot more to talk about. So, Tom, thank you very much for coming back today. My pleasure. And I just want to remind everybody before we get into today's discussion that we have a Everything Building Envelope newsletter, and to to subscribe to that, All you need to do is text the word building envelope to 22828. Again, that's building envelope, text it to 22828. We'll get you signed up. If you're in the building envelope community, there'll be items of interest to you technically and otherwise. So building envelope to 22828. So just to remind everybody from last time, or in case you didn't listen last time, Tom is an attorney. He's the chairman of the Construction Practice Group at Buchanan, Ingersoll, and Rooney. Buchanan is a national law firm and has six offices in Florida. So Tom, go into creative and cost-effective strategies to resolve building envelope performance disputes. And in our last podcast, we talked about risk allocation and risk management tools. So now, even if our listeners have employed all those measures, there, there's performance issues with the building envelope that can lead to litigation. And if that happens, how can parties resolve their dispute quickly and cost effectively? The first thing to recognize is that there isn't any one size fits all strategy for getting out of lawsuits. If there was, you wouldn't need lawyers who brought any value to the engagement, right? There'd be a playbook and everybody would follow it. That's just not the case. Each dispute is unique and each exit strategy has to be uh, fashioned to the unique details of the litigation. Personalities involved, their historical approach to litigation, how the lawsuit's being funded, all of those things can impact the ability to resolve the litigation effectively. However, in general terms, the earlier you can focus on a resolution strategy and the earlier you can resolve the dispute, the better. That is almost without exception. Lawsuits don't get better over time. They get more expensive. They get messier. They become a bigger distraction to your business. When a lawsuit first gets filed, you know, everybody's emotions are high. You've likely had you know, discussions with the parties prior to the lawsuit. There was some effort to determine responsibility and resolve it. Those might have been very heated, very nasty. They were unsuccessful by definition because now there's a lawsuit. Uh, At the start of the litigation, everybody's in their own echo chamber. They're only talking to the people in their business and their lawyers, and everybody's convinced that they've done absolutely nothing wrong, and their objective in the lawsuit is to be completely vindicated. That's when you hear people say things like, it's a matter of principle. That attitude erodes quickly as the legal bills start to come in every month. What you need to focus on early is the net cost of the litigation. Uh, Or if you're the owner, the net recovery. You measure success in a lawsuit by, if you're a defendant, it's the net cost. That's the litigation cost, the lawyer's fees, the expert fees, the cost of actually litigating the case, plus the settlement cost. If you're a point owner or other plaintiff, you measure success by the settlement 
amount minus the litigation costs, right? It's your net recovery. So early on, start thinking about a resolution strategy, start look at an opportunity to engage the parties in an effort at resolution as early as is practical, and focus on the net cost or the net recovery when you're making bottom line decisions. Yeah, so, you know, something that I always say, and, you know, this could be in a dispute or a real estate transaction or whatever, is that it's good to try to make a business decision, not an emotional decision, because the emotional decisions usually aren't good decisions. They're almost never good decisions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's tough. It's tough. So what are some of the strategies to resolve envelope, building envelope performance disputes and litigation early and cost effectively? So as, as we identified right out of the, the box, the earlier, the better. That's a judgment in itself, too early, uh, and that you're don't have enough people don't have enough information to make informed decisions and the likelihood of reaching a resolution is is diminished too late and you've got a lot of money invested in the lawsuit um, and that influences people's decisions and it affects the the net recovery or the net cost and uh, you miss the opportunity to maximize either so uh, identifying the right time but early to try to Get everybody working towards um, a joint resolution effort, and the most typical uh, mechanism for that is mediation. With building envelope performance disputes, because they all often center on questions of is the problem a design problem? Is it a construction problem? Um, if it's a construction problem, which element of the construction? Is there a product element? You know, was the right product used? Was there a manufacturing issue with the product? All those things are kind of swirling around. Being able to uh, resolve a case starts with trying to come up with some answers to those questions. But you've got a lot of people with differing interests, right? But they also have common interests. And the common interest that you can work on is that idea of the net cost and the net recovery. What I have employed effectively in some of these cases is a mediation involving a uh, technical advisor and, and the party's experts. If you can get the parties to initially try to reach agreement or at least narrow the dispute as to the root cause and extent of the problem, then that allows you to start uh, trying to develop a remedial plan. And it's the remedial plan that can then be the focal point around which a settlement is constructed. Can I ask a question? Is there a difference between a technical advisor and an expert? Yeah. So what I mean by that term is, in this context, everybody typically gets an expert, right? Every party goes out and, and obtains an expert, but it's their expert. So they, that expert in the litigation is working for a party. Uh, it is viewing the dispute from that party's perspective, and it is independent, moniker notwithstanding. It's working for that party, and the goal is to assist that party reach its objective, which is either recovering the most amount of money or avoiding, um, avoiding liability. So yeah, there are experts involved in almost every case, but they all are aligned with a party. I'm talking in this context of going into a mediation and employing an independent expert to try to facilitate agreement among the various party experts or to be a sounding board for the various party experts' opinions as to causation, opinions as to responsibility opinions as to the appropriate fix. How do you get to figuring out what the appropriate fix is? Well, Paul, it's what you do, right? When you're called in to try to, to deal with a, a building that's got a performance problem. You need to examine the documents. You need to potentially do some testing and forensic examination. All of the stuff that people are going to do 
or like or may do during the course of the litigation in preparation for going to trial to prove why they're not responsible or somebody else is responsible. Same exercise, but here it's being done with the goal of trying to reach some consensus or again at least narrow the disputes as to what is the root cause of the problem and how can we go about trying to fix it. So is there any merit in having everybody use a single independent expert? That's just not feasible and nobody's going to agree to that because you don't know if the case is going to settle. If it doesn't settle, you still got to gear up for litigation. So everybody's going to have their own experts, but involving an expert in a kind of a mediation role. Uh, typically, that expert is retained by an actual mediator, although paid for by the parties. And that expert advises the mediator, who then tries to work with the parties. But it's key that it's somebody who's well respected, that the independent party, the party experts, will take seriously, will respect his or her opinions and, and recommendations. They're a facilitator. They're not an arbitrator. We're not talking about bringing in somebody that everybody's going to agree to abide their decision. So everybody has independent experts and with not necessarily, or not usually, I guess I would say, the same opinions. There, there may be some agreement on some issues and there may maybe not so much on others. So how do you bring that all together to basically try to make progress? The format of mediation is very important in this regard because the mediation process is confidential in the sense that the things that are said, the information that is exchanged, the offers, responses can't be used as evidence in the litigation. So there isn't concern that if I concede a point in my discussion or I conceptually agree to a particular aspect of a repair plan, that that's going to be used against me at trial as evidence that I've admitted to wrongdoing. So the, the form of mediation is key to allowing everybody to come together uh, to cooperate and try to reach a compromise resolution that brings an end to the litigation. And that word compromise is a key. Can't go into it with the mind that I'm going to be proven right that the mediator is going to agree with me and he's going to tell everybody else that I shouldn't be in the lawsuit. People go into the mediation with that mindset, there's no chance of reaching a resolution. Everybody has to go into the mediation with the understanding that the purpose is not to determine who's right and wrong, who's liable or not liable, but to come up with a resolution that ends the litigation, stops the, the bleeding in terms of the cost, and for the owner, starts them down the path towards getting the problem that gave rise to the lawsuit fixed so they've got a properly performing building. One of my favorite sayings that I've heard, you know, which I think probably many of the listeners have heard as well, is that a good settlement is one that none of the parties are completely happy with, which, which means that they made a compromise. That's right. But uh, having said that, there are settlements that can leave everybody almost happy. <laughs> well, getting out of the lawsuit would be one of the things that makes people really happy, particularly sophisticated folks who've been down that path before and have, I like another one of my favorite expressions is have felt the pain. Right. Because think about it. I mean, litigation is a distraction for everybody, right? If you're a building owner, you spend a lot of money to build a building that you expect to generate revenues for you in terms of rent, if it's a commercial building, or to produce goods for you if it's a manufacturing facility. And it's not, it's not um, and it's affecting your business, and now you've got the distraction of this lawsuit. If you're a contractor, you want to be building things, right? You don't want to be sitting in a courtroom with a bunch of lawyers instead of pursuing uh, jobs, and uh, you certainly don't want to be writing checks every month to uh, a law firm. So with this, with, with the idea to have mediation as early as possible, I know I've been involved in disputes where there's reluctance to do that. And how do you overcome that reluctance? It can be tricky and you can't do it in every case. Like that goes back to my initial comment that, you know, there isn't a one size fits all strategy. But in my experience, key above all else is that somebody needs to take control. 
there needs to be one of the parties who takes control of the situation and gets everybody starting to think about working towards a resolution. And in construction litigation, particularly multi-party defect litigation of the kind you get with building envelope problems, you know, there's a couple of obvious candidates. One is the plaintiff, typically the owner. If the owner takes control of the situation, demonstrates a willingness to cooperate, demonstrates an interest in solving the problem as opposed to simply getting the largest dollar recovery. But if the owner communicates to the GC and the architect and the, and the other parties that, look, my interest in here is, is fixing the problem so we can move on, that you know, goes a long way towards getting the defendants to think the same way. On the defense side, it's the general contractor and the architect, right? The general contractor in particular, because he's responsible for the entire building, but the work was actually performed by his subcontractors and the materials were provided by his suppliers. And so he's in a unique position to work with all of the various parties who have contributed to the problem, perhaps, but who uh, also represent the potential for fixing it. You need one or a combination of those parties to really take control. One of the biggest impediments to early resolution of this nature is, you know, the owner will sue the, the architect, say, I got all these things wrong with the building and I think it's a design problem. The owner will also sue the general contractor, same lawsuit, but separate claims. I got all these problems with my building, it's a construction problem. Or And as between the two of those, the owner's position will be, I know I didn't do anything. I'm just the owner. It's either a design problem or a construction problem. You two figure out which. And the owner doesn't make any effort to determine what the root cause is because from a legal standpoint, it doesn't have to, is its thinking. Similarly, the general contractor brings every single subcontractor and supplier into the lawsuit as additional defendants. Those individual subcontractors and suppliers, their first reaction to is, what did I do wrong? What, how did my, how is my scope of work implicated? And the general contractor's response is, I don't know, because the owner doesn't tell me. I just know that to the extent it's a construction problem, I didn't self-perform. It's one of your all problem, not mine. And that makes it very difficult to start working towards a resolution because you have no agreement or identification of what the actual problem is, whose work is implicated, who's responsible, and what needs to be done to fix it. So, that is, so that's why it's so important that somebody take control of that process and start to work on figuring out what the root cause of the problem is, whose work is implicated. And only once you do that can you start figuring out how to fix it, which is how you settle the case. So the party that takes control, how do they go about figuring out what the problem is and how to fix it. Well, there's, you know, litigation in the adversarial, I mean, that's part of the adversarial litigation, right? That's the purpose of the trial. Everybody gets their expert, they go in, they testify as to their theory about what the problem is and who's responsible, and then the jury sorts it out. You know, 12 people who they pulled off the street who don't know anything about building envelopes. So that's one way to resolve it. Nobody wants to get there. So the other way to resolve it is for everybody to agree to go to, a, to mediation where they bring their experts and their experts give their input and the mediator, with the help of a technical advisor, listens to everybody's input and then starts to try to craft some consensus on things. And, you know, the mediation doesn't have to take place in one day. You can have an initial mediation where everybody gets their input and you identify, well, we seem to have disagreement on this issue, and the BERTS or the independent consultant, if there is one, can look at that and say, okay, is there a way for us to answer that question? Can we go out and do some testing on the building to determine if it is, in fact, a problem with the sill, the sills, or if it's a perimeter sealing problem, where exactly is the source of the water infiltration? And if parties are working towards trying to resolve the dispute short of going to court, they can agree on that testing, collectively fund it, get the results, 
factor that into their negotiations and decision making. Hopefully they can reach some agreements on, okay, we've eliminated the sealant. So the sealant supplier is not somebody who we're going to expect to participate further. It's that sort of investigative process and consensus building as to what exactly is the problem, who's potentially responsible, that's necessary before we can start talking about fixing it to resolve the dispute. So you do the testing and forensic examination, and you get to some degree of consensus amongst the parties as to what the extent and cause of the problem is. What do you do next? Well, if you've made it that far, you're a long way because there's usually a lot of bumps in the road to get to that point. If you have actually gotten to consensus as to what the problem is. You have achieved a lot already, and I think the chances of your being able to resolve the dispute are very good. So now the next step is we have agreement or some sense of agreement on what the problem is or what the likely cause of the problem is. Now we got to agree on how to fix it. What's the most cost-effective, reasonable way to address the problem? And here, again, we're talking compromise. So you're not going to get a resolution if the owner unrelenting position is, I will accept nothing less than ripping the entire envelope off of the building and reinstalling the envelope with all new upgraded componentry, and I expect you to pay for it. That's not going to get you a settlement. No. And we've all been there, done that in that respect. And it's funny because when they start out like that, they don't always end up like that, obviously. I can think of situations where been involved where that was actually be the right fix, but even then, there's no money to pay for it, and the owner ultimately accepted a reasonable settlement that was within the resources that were available, I guess I would say. You're right, Paul, and that's why I made the, the comment up front about every situation is different. There are some cases where that is the right fix, but there's probably many more cases where it's not necessary. There is an effective fix short of that that will allow the building to perform adequately. Granted, it may not be what the owner had paid for, but again, we're talking about trying to resolve a dispute and compromise that avoids the expense of the litigation, avoids the risk of pushing this decision in the hands of 12 people who don't know anything about building, and increases the net bottom line forever. And, and that's managing risk too, isn't it? Yes. So let's say that everything's go well. And, and by the way, this could be years in, in the making, right? Hopefully not, but it can be. And you fashion a remediation plan that everybody's buying in on. How do you build a settlement around it? If you're that far, you've probably solved some of those issues. You know, so for example, and that can be the benefit of an early mediation too, is identifying what the hurdles are, what the possibilities are. And plaintiff's attorney has the case on a pure contingency, or if the owner's interest really is in just in money, that's going to come out in the mediation. If the defendants are trying to work towards a, a fix, a settlement resolves around a fix, that's going to come out. But that's important information to know, because now you know what you're dealing with, you know where your efforts are best spent. But we're assuming that it's not one of those cases. We have an owner whose interest really is in getting the problem fixed. We have a plaintiff's lawyer who is uh, amenable uh, to a resolution that is not just a payment of which he gets a piece. And so then the settlement resolves around that, the implementation of that fix. And there's a lot of variations on that depending on the individual facts. You know, A, you need the consultants to have some degree of comfort in both the reasonableness of the fix, that it's not overkill, but that it's also effective. You need to get the owner's buy-in, obviously, that the fix, whatever it is, uh, gives them a building that performs to its expectations or as near to those ex expectations as possible under the circumstances. That often requires some margin of error in the remediation plan that gives the owner the benefit of the doubt on some of the issues in dispute. You know, you may not reach agreement that there's a problem with a particular detail. You can address it and compensate for it or fix it at a relatively small cost. So you take that issue of, um, out of the, off the table. You don't reach agreement that it's a problem, but your fix addresses it so that if it is a problem, the owner 
can be comfortable that it's addressed. That's a key, is taking into account that there may not be agreement on what all the contributing causes are. So you've got to come up with a remedial plan that has belts and suspenders to some degree, that not only fixes what, what you may think is the problem, but uh, compensates for other potential problems. Getting the designer and the contractor's buy-in is reasonableness and proportionality. It can't be an economically wasteful remediation plan. It has to be cost efficient, and it can't represent a betterment at the contractor's expense. If there's going to be a betterment element to this, the owner's going to end up with a better system than he contracted and paid for, then that ought to be recognized in the settlement from a financial perspective. So how do you make all that happen? Magic. <laughs> <laughs> and a really good lawyer. Seems like it, but you're the magician, right? I've actually been, you know, been involved in cases that have settled this way on a number of occasions. The most advantageous way to do this, if you can, and you can't in every case, is if the parties, the, the contractors, the suppliers, the architects, are actually able to provide their goods and services and, and materials as an in-kind settlement. Because that's a much lower net cost to them, right? If I'm a manufacturer, the cost for me to supply replacement product is my cost, right? It's much lower than if I have to write a check to pay for another manufacturer to make replacement materials because there's going to be markup and profit margin. Um, it's going to be way above cost. Similarly, if you're a contractor contributing labor, there's a cost associated, yes, but it's, again, less than writing a check for somebody else to do it and make a profit on it. So whenever it's possible, having the parties participate in the fix is the most economical resolution. Is there a circumstance where remediating the problem isn't necessarily the best solution? And if so, what are some of the obstacles that get in the way? Yeah, I mean, there's some initial obstacles that make it not a, a realistic possibility that we mentioned, where the owner isn't interested in it and fix, right? They, they're they just looking for uh, money because maybe they don't own the building anymore. Maybe they've sold it, and what they're seeking to recover is the perceived diminution in the, the value of the building, that they got less for it when they sold it. Or there's a, a plaintiff's lawyer on a contingency fee arrangement, and it's difficult you know, for somebody to take 35% of the value of a fix. And that becomes not impossible to deal with, but it can be very, very difficult to figure out how the lawyer is going to get his share of the settlement. And then you have contractors and manufacturers who aren't around anymore. They're, they're not viable. They've gone bankrupt. And they're not available to perform the remedial work or to provide the replacement materials. You're going to have to come up with an alternative source of labor or materials. Where there's really bad blood between the parties, where the discussions before the litigation got really nasty, people don't trust each other and want nothing to do with each other anymore. That's a particular problem for contractors and manufacturers. If they have an owner who they believe has been unreasonable, who they believe is simply looking to win the lottery in the litigation, that can be difficult to overcome, even if they try to dispel that impression. And they don't want to be involved with that owner anymore. They'd actually prefer to write a check and be done with them than to go in and provide replacement material or to do remedial work and then have to potentially be responsible for the replacement materials or the remedial work. Right? Their concern is it's never going to end. They're just going to keep getting called back and the owner's going to keep asking for more and more. That is one of those things that the parties have to work really hard to regain trust and to demonstrate good faith that, no, you know, the effort here is just to get it fixed and that they're going to be reasonable to deal with going forward. So there are a lot of obstacles to a monetary settlement. Are there strategies for getting over those obstacles or getting around them? There are. You need to be creative. And again, people need to be willing to, to compromise. And you have to maintain the trust between the lawyers, between the parties, between the consultants. There's some creative financing solutions where there is a an element of payment that simply can't be avoided as part of the settlement. You can look at the saved defense costs that you're avoiding 
um, and that you may have reserved for or that your insurance carrier may have reserved for and apply those reserved defense costs toward the early settlement, the financial component of it. You can explore cost sharing arrangements where you know the owner participates in the cost with the defendants. You can add value. I said earlier that you have to avoid betterment at the contractor's expense, but one very effective approach is to incorporate a betterment at a discount. The fix upgrades materials enhances the design, gives the owner more value than he was actually entitled to under the contract, but at a discounted cost. So the owner shares in the cost of the betterment, as does the contractor or the supplier. They supply it at cost or at a steep discount. The owner covers that cost. It's a win-win. The owner gets actually a better building or system than it originally uh, contracted for, fixes its problem, and the cost to the defendants is either covered or mitigated. The key, and I keep coming back to this, but the key to all of this, actually being able to achieve a resolution built around fixing the problem at an early stage of the litigation is communication and trust. Lawyers need to talk to each other. They need to row in the same direction towards trying to resolve the litigation, not posture not try to gain advantage, because if they start doing that, the other lawyers are going to see what's going on. They're going to adopt similar approaches because there won't be trust. I mean, the lawyers, that they're actually in good faith working to try to resolve the dispute, as opposed to just trying to better position themselves for the litigation as it heads towards trial. Same with respect to the parties. To the extent, extent that the parties communicate directly in the process, they need to convey a sincere desire to try to resolve this, try to repair a business relationship, to try to repair or maintain a reputation in the marketplace, to maintain the trust between the parties that they're actually trying to solve their problem as opposed to take advantage of the other side. Those two elements, open communication and trust, are the key because if you lose those, if people aren't communicating, people don't trust each other, then you're not going to be able to reach agreement. And the parties aren't going to be comfortable compromising because they're going to be fearful that they're, they've just been taken advantage of. And nobody likes to feel like they've been taken advantage of. So the default mechanism is to say, hold on, slow down. I'm not going to do this. I'm not comfortable. So, Tom, really great stuff. I know with big interest to our listeners who obviously don't want to be involved in litigation, and if they're lawyers or experts, maybe, <laughs> and if they do get involved, you know, the exit strategy, the quick exit strategy is really, really important. So, thank you very much for, you know, the time. We did two episodes, which is really great. And thank you for sharing your wisdom with the listeners with the really valuable information for them to consider and implement going forward. Thanks for including me, Paul. I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was great. So I want to just remind everybody again that we have the Everything Building Envelope newsletter that I think that would be a real interest to our listeners and you to subscribe to that all you need to do is text the word building envelope to 22828 again building envelope to 22828 like to thank everybody for listening to the everything building envelope podcast and this is paul beer saying so long till next time thanks for joining us today please subscribe to this podcast on itunes or stitcher for more information on the Everything Building Envelope, previous episodes, show notes, bonus video content, and much more, check out our website, everythingbuildingenvelope.com.